This week in Starbase, SpaceX is full steam ahead with preparations for Starship Flight 4. In service of that flight, Ship 29 has been rolled out to Pad B and is getting ready for engine testing. And at the same time, the orbital launch pad is seeing repairs and refurbishment work done on it ahead of Starship's next flight. Simultaneously, the two tower sections of Starbase Tower 2 are in work over at the Sanchez lot, still, and I almost forgot, Gwyn Shotwell has stated the Starship program goals for 2024, so there's a lot of interesting information to unpack here. Let's get started. I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. Let's start off at the production site and discuss the many changes that are currently happening to the Starbase skyline. With the successful installation of the door on Mega Bay 1 complete, SpaceX went ahead with the installation of the door on Mega Bay 2. This door has been installed very quickly compared to the first one, with the third section being installed this past week. I know, right? Boo doors! But at the same time, this will enable SpaceX to have a higher level of quality control with subsequent vehicles, which, of course, for moon-bound ships, is a good thing. SpaceX has likely been waiting for this door and the stands to be fully completed before rolling Ship 30 into Mega Bay 2 for engine installation. In order to get Ship 30 into Mega Bay 2, SpaceX will need to move Ship 31 out of the way first. This ship has been in the heat shield work area of the high bay for some time now, and it's still not completed. SpaceX may just be focusing on getting Ship 29 and possibly also Ship 30 ready for flight. Staying with the production site, the Star Factory continues to grow, and pretty soon this corner here will be full of glass panels. This corner of the Star Factory will end up looking a lot like the Starlink building built in Austin, Texas. Although we most likely won't get to see the nose cone construction inside of it, it will still be a cool addition to the Starbase skyline. Speaking of new additions to the skyline, the new five-level office building is starting to rise out of the ground, with columns and even horizontal segments being installed. This building should provide tons of office space for all the engineers, managers, and technical leads that work in the Mega Bays, High Bay, and Star Factory. And to add to that, lots of groundwork is continuing on the new six-level parking garage that will be located behind the Stargate building. With the explosive growth of Starbase, SpaceX has been struggling with parking issues and finding a place for all of its workers to park, so this new parking structure should hopefully alleviate those issues. As we can see here, SpaceX has been slowly adding the internals to tower sections 8 and 9, which are the top two sections of the second orbital launch tower. This will enable teams to have to do less work once these sections are stacked at the pad. Some of the other sections, mainly the first, second, third, sixth, and seventh sections, are still at the port of Brownsville, and SpaceX appears to be adding stairs to these sections before rolling them to Sanchez. It's unclear why SpaceX is doing this work at the port, considering teams built the parking spots for them at the Sanchez lot so they could be bolted down and worked on. The last two sections needed, which are number four and five, are still at Roberts Road and still being worked on. All right, now we have some really fun information to break down. The goals for the Starship program in 2024. So let's tear this apart. Tear this apart? Who talks like that? During the satellite conference this past week, SpaceX's chief operating officer, Gwen Shotwell, talked about the primary goals of the Starship program that SpaceX would like to accomplish by the end of the year. This comes on the heels of a spectacular third flight test in which SpaceX hit many milestones, but it still has much to do going forward. The stated goals include getting Starship to orbit, deploying satellites, and, get this one, recovering both stages. That means ship and booster. Is that even possible by the end of the year? Either way, even if SpaceX is just talking about recovering both stages after a soft splash down in the ocean, that is seriously ambitious and seriously impressive. The first two goals don't seem too difficult to accomplish, considering where the program is right now. But that last one does seem like a stretch to occur this year, so let's go over how SpaceX can accomplish these goals and whether full recovery by the end of the year is even possible. First, getting Starship into orbit only takes one more step for SpaceX to achieve. This would be the in-space burn that had been planned for Flight 3, which, as a reminder, was canceled due to the excessive roll rates of the ship. 
and hopefully this will be completed during Flight 4. Once SpaceX checks this milestone off the list, Starship will be able to circularize its orbit and enter into a stable orbit from which it can deploy satellites. Speaking of deploying satellites, this is the Starship program's goal after teams prove they can fire a Raptor engine in space. As of right now, according to Gwyn Shotwell, Flight 4 will not have any satellites on board, as SpaceX first needs to iron out the issues teams appear to have encountered with the payload bay door on Flight 3. Once these two objectives are complete, SpaceX can begin to use Starship to deploy Starlink satellites into orbit. To deploy satellites other than Starlink, teams must first design and test a different payload door design, which we haven't seen any recent progress on, at least not out in the open. Surely it's something that's being worked on, either at Hawthorne or inside the Star Factory or both, but until we see it rolled out into one of the bays, anyone's guess as to what that'll look like. And then we come to the third goal, recovering both the ship and the booster by the end of the year. And boy oh boy, SpaceX has their work cut out for them here. We're going to assume that in this case, Gwyn Shotwell is talking about catching both booster and ship, and not just recovering these after a soft splash down in the ocean. So let's start with booster recovery. As of Flight 3, the booster has only completed the boost back burn to put itself on a trajectory back toward the launch site. However, during the glide back, as you may remember, the booster appeared to lose roll control and most of the engines on the landing burn failed to ignite. So SpaceX needs to get the booster under control and get the landing burn working so that a soft water splashdown is possible. Once they can prove that they can do a soft water splashdown reliably, then they need to work on accuracy and hitting a point in space exactly. This will probably take a couple of tries, like with Falcon 9. Although, the Super Heavy booster may be easier to control with the better thrust-to-weight ratio of its 33 Raptor engines. And once that is all finally complete, SpaceX will be able to begin attempting to catch a booster with the old chopsticks there. Side note though, it's currently unknown whether the arms are in a configuration that actually allows them to catch a booster, or if more modifications to them are required to enable this capability. And finally in the list of goals, we have recovery of Starship, which I don't think I need to tell you is far more complex than just recovering a booster. In fact, it's the whole reason to Etra for the Starship program, a rapidly reusable second stage. It's probably the hardest problem in all of spaceflight. First, to even make this possible, the ship needs to be under control and survive reentry, obviously. During Flight 3, once again, SpaceX lost control of the ship during the coast phase, which then led to its loss during re-entry. And that stuck open payload bay door allowing plasma to enter inside the vehicle surely didn't help. In order to get back to Earth in one piece, the ship needs to be stable with the heat shield in the correct orientation, and the heat shield has to actually work. Coming up on Flight 4, SpaceX will most likely solve the attitude control issues. At least, that's my guess but it's hard to know how the heat shield will fare on re-entry or how many times it will take for Starship to complete re-entry in one piece. Then, once it's proven that Starship can successfully re-enter the atmosphere, SpaceX needs to again prove that they can conduct the flip and burn maneuver with Starship in a precise manner. Of course, SpaceX has shown that it can do the flip and burn maneuver, but it was only completed once and with a much older design of Starship. That's SN15, if you don't remember. Now, I can already hear some of you saying in the comments, but Jack, that sounds like a perfectly accomplishable list of goals to hit before the end of the year. And to that I say, yes. But now we get to the extremely tricky part, and that is catching the ship with the chopsticks. Currently, the system that the chopsticks use to interface with the ship won't work unless the ship can hover in place for a few seconds. SpaceX will most likely need to redesign the ship to chopstick interface with deployable lifting pins on the ship. Basically the same pins that are used on the booster, but deployable so they can be stowed for entry and then deployed for landing. However, it's also possible, even if remotely so, that SpaceX will have to resort back to using landing legs and a landing pad for Starship. However, if there ever was a company and a team of engineers capable of solving this insanely challenging problem, I would bet on SpaceX being the ones to do it. But by the end of the year, that part's tricky. Certainly by sometime in 2025, but who knows? So to summarize, SpaceX has some pretty easy and accomplishable goals listed for 2024, but at the same time, they also have some fairly lofty ones. 
Do you think SpaceX will be able to recover both booster and ship by the end of the year? Or do you think it'll take longer than that? You know the drill, let us know in the comments. All right, now let's talk a little bit about Flight 4. Gwen Shotwell has already stated that SpaceX wants to be ready to fly again in about six weeks. Of course, SpaceX still has these static fires on both vehicles left to complete. A six engine static fire for Ship 29 and a 33 engine static fire for Booster 11. SpaceX may also opt to complete a simulated in-space burn on Ship 29, just like teams completed with Ship 28 and Ship 26. In order to make this six-week timeline a reality, teams have already rolled out Ship 29 to Pad B so it can complete its engine testing campaign. There are closures for this testing on March 25th, 26th, and 27th, and are during the normal 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Central Daylight Time hours. Now, in terms of Booster 11, which has been quietly biding its time sitting on the right-hand workstand in Mega Bay 1 since November 20th, 2023, this booster should, by now, have all of its engines and be ready for static fire testing as soon as the orbital launch mount becomes operational. And hey, speaking of the orbital launch mount, the back of the booster quick disconnect has been removed. This revealed heavily damaged booster propellant hoses, which have since been removed and will either be completely replaced or repaired. SpaceX is also hard at work repairing and inspecting the rest of the orbital launch pad. A very good sign that Booster 11 may arrive sooner rather than later is that recently teams reinstalled the booster alignment pins on the orbital launch mount deck. These were installed only a week after Flight 3, which is the fastest this has been done so far. And this gives us a lot of hope for the fact that this pad shouldn't need too much major work to turn around. Luckily, this time the ship quick disconnect appears to be in much better shape, so the upgrades and repairs SpaceX did to it after Flight 2 appear to have held up very well. Now, as stated in last week's Starbase update, the filing SpaceX made with the Federal Communications Commission states the no earlier than date for Starship Flight 4 as April 15th. Now, both Elon Musk and Gwynne Shotwell have stated that they expect at least a six-week turnaround ahead of Flight 4, which, given other possible delays, would push Flight 4 into launching sometime around mid-May. As always, we'll just have to wait and see exactly how fast SpaceX is able to get the orbital launch pad repaired and ready for the next launch. This is particularly interesting because the turnaround time between Flight 3 and Flight 4 might end up being more indicative of what this pad will be capable of for the foreseeable future. Before we finish talking about the orbital launch pad, we have some breaking news that I'd be remiss if we didn't cover, and that is that SpaceX has once again begun working on the Starship launch pad way across the Gulf of Mexico at old Kennedy Space Center's LC-39A. Teams have been taking off the tops of the legs to supposedly prepare for the rollout of the orbital launch mount that was recently moved outside of Hangar M. However, SpaceX appears to have completely removed two of the orbital launch mount legs ahead of what could be a major redesign of the launch pad. Once again, we have to wait and see exactly what's going on here, but at the very least, it's encouraging that work at the Starship launch pad at LC-39A has once again started, even if that means they tear down the pad for a second time before rebuilding it for the third time. Next up this week, we have to bid farewell to a very old booster, and I'm talking, of course, about Booster 4. In case you don't remember, Booster 4 and Ship 20 were the first vehicles to complete a full Starship stack, way back in early August of 2021. They were lifted up onto a comparatively barren orbital launch mount using the old LR-11350 Frankencrane, and SpaceX played Fly Me to the Moon over the loudspeakers. In retrospect, this whole setup just looks incredibly janky and hilarious, but also at the same time, sort of retro-futuristic, and I can't help but love it. Good times. Although Booster 4 would only go on to complete four cryogenic tests on its own, while also completing two cryogenic tests with Ship 20 stacked on top, it helped iron out issues with the orbital tank farm, as SpaceX was still learning how to build a tank farm for the most powerful rocket in history. During these tests, however, the booster became damaged by foreign object debris, FOD, and could not be repaired for engine testing. Over the past few weeks, SpaceX has been removing grid fins to make it easier to fit Booster 4 into the Mega Bay, and then teams this week added scaffolding just above the common dome to facilitate an easy process of cutting the booster in half. 
Booster 4 was then rolled into Mega Bay 1 for scrapping after being in the Rocket Garden for 630 days. Crews would waste no time, and by the next day, Booster 4's methane tank was cut from its liquid oxygen tank. So goodbye, Booster 4, although I can't say I'm sad to see you go. Sitting out in the Texas sun for two years and just rusting away couldn't have been fun. But either way, thank you for your contribution to the Starship program. Also, if you need somewhere to put a whole bunch of obsolete Raptor engines, um, I'll, um, I'll, I, I, I would take one, you know, or two, I'd take a couple Raptors, why not? All right, that's it for this week. As always, thanks for watching, and don't forget, be excellent to each other. Hi, is this Elon? Yeah, can I have a couple obsolete Raptors? Because I would, you know, I, I would, I would like them. Oh, it's, it's not, I don't have Elon's number.